Um, before we get started, I want to recommend some books. I am an avid reader. Readers are leaders. And so a lot of what we derive our teachings from are curriculum and just content that we read. And so, ladies, for tonight's purposes, I have um, been reading this book by Lisa Turkhurst, who's my absolute favorite in the whole wide world. I listen to her podcast. I think she's incredible. But it's called Unglued, and it's about how to handle and tame our emotions. And um, she has a lot of tidbits on how to handle and tame our emotions with our children, because they tend to bring out the worst emotions that they could possibly bring out the the monster inside of us that we did not even know existed just ah, when our kids are crazy. So this is a very, very, very good book. Also, um, the last time I spoke, I've had several of you um, that I spoke to all of y'all, I spoke on boundaries. And I've had a lot of you asking me, you know, what books are you reading? Where did you get that teaching from? And so the main book that I got that teaching from was called Keep Your Love On um, by Danny Silk. And it's a very, very, very good book. I highly, highly recommend it. I think Everyone in this room should read it. It's very good on um, boundaries, on self-control. This is where we got the concentric circles that we talked about, how everyone should not have equal access to your time. And so this is where all that information came from. So I'm going to give this one away to somebody today who is a parent, but a parent of an adult child. Parent, oh, Missy, you're bam, right up, girl. You go. So there you go. That is a very, very good book. And then for tonight's purposes, a lot of the teaching is out of this book. Again, Danny Silk. I guess I'm on a Danny Silk kick. But this is called Loving Your Kids on Purpose. And so a lot of the content that we are covering tonight is straight from this book. She's here! Louisa's here! Oh, yay! Hands are going up. They're the ones that didn't get it. So awesome. Thank you. Uh, so this is a really, really good book. It's geared more towards um, kids with, that are smaller in the home. So like young kids to maybe 18 that still live at home with you. So I want to give that away to somebody who still has Lizette. Okay, that was like, bam, can you go give that to Lizette? Help a sister out. Thank you, Sammy. So anyway, that's a really, really good book. We're going to even read an excerpt from it tonight. It's awesome. Again, highly recommend it. It's now on my husband's next book list to read because I'm like, you have to read this. This is so good. So um, I have a disclaimer before we get started. I do not know squat about parenting. And so I'm not up here because I am a parenting expert and I have it all figured out and I'm so awesome and you should do what I say. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not an expert. I fail miserably daily. I'm constantly on my knees in prayer. Half my prayer life is devoted to my girls because I feel like I'm constantly jacking them up. So I'm not up here because I'm really, really good at it, but I do read a lot and I've collected a lot of information throughout the years, and I really am very passionate about how we parent our kids. And being a freedom ministry, it is paramount. The connection we have with our kids as moms and dads is a direct correlation to how your kids will see God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, and it will impact them in a huge spiritual way. And so I feel like we cannot avoid the topic of parenting. We cannot avoid that you know, we teach on mother wounds and father wounds and how much that can really, really hurt and wound our hearts and souls. And so tonight we're just going to talk about freedom in parenting. And this was quite the topic. I mean, we could have taken this about 50 bajillion, 75 million ways because there is so much content on parenting. Like I said, half my bookshelves are probably just parenting books. And so, um, but we, I decided to keep this very, very freedom focused, freedom-based, and just teach it like it's freedom ministry, because that's the plan, right? That was the plan tonight. So um, these books are great. Like I said, I love reading. I don't think there's any one book that's a parenting manual that we can subscribe or live by, except for the Bible. I think if you read the Bible and you pay close attention to how God parents us, that's a pretty good indication of how we should be parenting our little babies and our big babies, and our grandbabies, and all sorts of babies. So that is that, that's really the number one place we can get our, really, our um, information from. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started. So God, thank you that you are amazing at parenting. Thank you that you are both mom and dad and friend and counselor. And Lord, for all those out there who are parents, for all those out there who have parents, for all those out there who want to be parents, 
Lord, would you come into this place tonight and open up our hearts and just speak to us? Lord, would you set us on a path, Father, where we are parenting in the same way you are parenting because we share your heartbeat. Would you just take all that ginormous love that you have for us and allow us to feel it in ways we've never felt it before so that we have something of substance to give to those precious children that you've entrusted us with. And Lord, I just want to say a special prayer out there for those who are not parents yet, but may be trying. Lord, would you bless those people? Father, would you make them parents in the name of Jesus? And for all those who always wanted to be parents, but it maybe never happened for them, would you comfort them in a way that is so powerful and mighty, in a way that only you can do? And I pray that this teaching brings forth life to them and everyone around them. Lord, thank you for your divine presence. Thank you that you're amazing and awesome at everything you do. In your precious name I pray, amen. Okay, so last week, Robert and Louisa Fernandez taught us in Freedom Ministry on marriage, and it was so good. We just soaked it up, and it was awesome. They did an amazing job, Um, and I'm going to uh, piggyback a little bit off of what they started teaching on and take a few segments of their teachings because we had freedom in marriage and now we're going to do freedom in parenting so that we can kind of get that whole family dynamic. And for those of you asking about, are y'all going to do a class on freedom from your in-laws? No, we don't have that class, but once we develop it, I'll be on the front row listening. No, I'm just kidding. I have great in-laws great mother-in-law. She's awesome. So um, Robert took us through Exodus chapter 4, and we talked a little bit. I don't know why, but pastor's been preaching on Moses. Robert talked about Moses, and now I'm going to piggyback off of that, and we're just going to be on Moses for a while. So that's just going to be the theme of the month. But but Robert took us through Exodus chapter 4, and it was a chapter where Moses and his wife Sephora get into a little powwow, and it's a pretty serious little fight. They're having a little bit of marital issues, and it's all over circumcision of, we don't know if it's one or both sons. And so Zephora picks up a flint and circumcises the son and throws it at his feet. And Robert kind of talked about how your attitude in your marriage really affects that relationship. And if you go into an, a marriage or any type of relationship with a bad attitude, you're going to get what you put in to that relationship. You get what you put into it. So what ends up happening, if you fast forward to the story in Exodus chapter 18, you see that Moses has performed all these amazing miracles. He's partnered with Aaron, done all these 10 plagues, like changed the world. Some of the world's greatest things have happened. And then all of a sudden, his father-in-law brings his wife and kids back to him. And you kind of look at it and think, so they weren't there? Like, when did they leave? And a lot of commentators believe that this little powwow they had, Moses and Zephora, separated them for a time. And they were actually separated. And in Exodus 18, the father-in-law is bringing the wife and the kids back and saying, okay, you went, you did your thing, you did your ministry, now let's reconcile. Let's work this out. And so we really looked in marriage at the fact that you know what, if you want to have freedom in marriage, you have to first be free yourself, right? You have to experience freedom. We talk about freedom, for those of you who who haven't ever been through freedom, don't quite know what that is, we define freedom as simply responding to God as the person that he created and redeemed you to be. So when we say the word freedom, we're talking about who are you created and redeemed to be? What is your identity in Christ? And if you don't know that in the sanctity of marriage, That's pretty scary because then you're going to start pulling your identity from your spouse and your job and a lot of different things. And so when you look at Moses and his family, who were the ones that do not have a front row seat to the most powerful time, some of the most powerful moments in history? It was his family. Man, that really bites that his family wasn't there at probably the most important time in his life because he got into an argument with his wife. And who are the casualties here? His kids. How much powerful would it be for his two boys to have been right by his side when he's 
going to Pharaoh saying, let my people go, ten times over, and miracle after miracle is taking place. But they don't get to be there because mom and dad had a really hard time working it out. So when we look into marriage as the fact that you can't give what you don't possess, if you're not already free and you're not free inside of a marriage, there's not much likelihood you're going to put any kind of freedom into that person. And when we say that, we really feel like, hey, if I'm free and I know who I am as a person, then I'm going to be confident in that. And then I'm going to look at my husband and I'm going to call out those things that are true about him, and I'm going to make sure that I'm going to do my part to make sure he's free too, right? So that he's knowing who he's created and redeemed to be. The same is true. The same foundational thoughts are very true with our children. We can't expect to have free kids if we're not free ourselves because they can actually become casualties as well if we're not careful. We've had several people ask us um, here recently, hey, are y'all going to do a freedom ministry for kids? Um, And although that's a great idea, and we are thinking and dreaming and praying that direction. You know, we would never be able to do something like that and work with kids if their parents didn't agree to do freedom ministry themselves. If their parents don't know who they're created and redeemed to be, we could do more damage than good by speaking that into their kids. And so freedom is a family thing. It's a family affair. There's a saying that you can't see goodness in any other person until you see it in yourself first, right? And that's so true with our kids. Um, If freedom is becoming who God created and redeemed you to be, have you become free? Have you gone through that process? Have you allowed the Lord to speak to you about your identity and actually believe what he said? Do you believe that God crafted you together and formed every fiber of your being and every cell in your body? that there is only one you, and you are unique, and you are valuable. Because if you can believe that about yourself, then you can believe that about your kids and your children. So we're going to move into this teaching with the mindset that kids are not a problem to solve. They're not a project to work on. They're not a burden. They are a blessing. But the more than important, they are precious valuables that God entrusts to our care. And we are to steward them with the best of our ability. Proverbs 22, 6. I know you knew you were going to hear this. Train up a child in the way they should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. In Hebrew, this literally translate, translates, train a child according to his way. We think that this is about giving, like, sound structure and um, instruction and get them in church and make sure they're in Sunday school and, and make sure that they're reading their Bible every night. And, and, and that's not necessarily exactly what this means because a lot of people have tried that route and failed miserably, right? I can name a few to you that I know personally. What this means when we talk about this, we're talking about things that are— uh, Sorry, I lost my place. When we think think this is about giving our children sound structure, it's not. What it's more about is taking those things that are necessary, customizing your parenting approach with each of your children based on their unique DNA and gift set. So what this looks like is my husband and I recently, um, we're noticing things in our daughters that they're really, really good at. So we're noticing spiritual gifts. We're noticing Um, Some of them are, one of mine's very, very athletically inclined. She's really good at sports. You know, one of them sings really good. So we're noticing, like, these are the things that God has placed in them that they're really, really good at. These are their strengths. We're starting to call out spiritual gifts in them that we're starting to identify. And our focus then is to nurture those and grow those and train those up because we believe that God has put them there, and that's the way they shall go. So when they're older, they will not depart from it. So we're studying their strengths and weaknesses. We're discovering their giftings, what excites them, and then we teach them how to grow and steward that, even if we don't know how to even begin that. You know, I'm not a singer at all, but my little Emery loves to sing. So I am doing my best to try to teach her how to sing or look into singing lessons or something to help grow that and feed that and nurture that. I'm just doing my part. And we have to teach them that God not only wants to use them later in life in that, but he has equipped them to use them right now 
where they're at. Because I think we fall into a trap a lot of times as parents of, oh, when you're older, you're going to be amazing. You're going to change the world for Jesus. You're going to do this. Why aren't we telling our children what they're doing now? Hey, you're awesome. You just gave somebody a hug when they were sad. That's amazing. You just changed the world for Jesus with that. And really foster that. Foster what they're doing right now to teach them these are good things to do. So we have to be a conduit of our children's destiny. I'm not saying there's a right way to parent. I'm saying there's a right approach to parenting, where the goal of parenting is to teach kids to steward their own freedom. Freedom being who God created and redeemed them to be. So most of us were probably raised in a home, I'm going to be very honest, I was too, where the goal in parenting was generally, hey, I'm going to teach my kids to obey, to submit to authority, and to comply with my rules. It is my way or the highway. And there's a lot of control and fear that goes into parenting kids that way. I, I was parented that way, and I started parenting that way whenever we had kids because I didn't know any different. And so I really thought my goal is you're going to obey me, little girl, whether you like it or not, because I'm the mama, and kids obey mamas, right? And that's kind of a scary place to be. In every relationship, there's someone who is powerful and someone who is powerless, and as parents, we generally take on the powerful role. And we, we show them who's boss, and we punish them into compliance, right? So if we want a parent like this, they will never learn to discover their own identity under your domain. And I want you to think about that. They never have the opportunity to steward their own freedom until they're out of the house, out on their own, and then how do you think that's going to go? College hits, and I'm gone, mom and dad, you tied me down so tight, like, I'm gone. Parte. I'm not under your domain anymore. Parenting isn't easy. There is not a one-size-fits-all approach. I had two kids, two different personality types, two different sass back, talk to you back, different. One I can just look at, give them the evil eye, and they're like, good. They're good. The other one is like, go ahead, mom, make my day, and we will go at it. So it's not easy. We have to customize our approach to parenting to that specific child. And I think that that entails hearing God on their behalf. I think that entails prophetic words over them. I think that entails praying for them in such a way that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has a plan for their life. And we kind of have a good idea what that plan is. And a lot of times that means removing your plans, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, for their life and replacing them with God's. And that's really hard to do, especially for us ladies, because we've already planned it out in second grade. What we were going to have, what we were going to name them, what kind of dresses they would wear, what jobs our kids would have, we have it all up here. And so when it comes time to break that and let God take control, it is really, really hard. A lot of times we hope, we try to grow the strengths we wish we had in our children. How dangerous is that? That's not good. Or we see something in them that we don't like, like, oh, I'm not really into the music thing. Come on, let's go play soccer instead, you know? And we're squashing what God has placed in them, what is innate to their nature. So the goal of parenting should be, again, to teach our kids to steward freedom. How important is it to know their identity. How important is it for us to be the biggest proponents of speaking scripture over our kids' lives? How important is it for us to be the biggest proponents of saying, you know what, God made you to be a leader. So let me show you what being a leader means and actually teaching them how to do that. If we called the things out of them that are God-given strengths and encourage them and believe that they are significant with a purpose, a calling, and God-given abilities, we can maximize our kids to the point of they can't, they can't fail. Not, not failing, like not make mistakes, because we all do that. But if we can actually set them on a path where they have, they're hearing God's voice, they're staying focused on the kingdom of God, they're connecting to the Lord daily, they know who he's created and redeemed them to be, they're unstoppable. You can't stop a kid like that. My girl, goal for my girls, and every morning when I get up and pray, and I mean it from the depths of my heart, is for them to be world changers. 
I want them to be some of the most powerful women of their generation. And I'm very specific when I pray, Lord Jesus, please let them accomplish that with the most boring testimony in the history of testimonies. No drugs, no alcohol, no, no anything. Because I want them to be powerful and mighty for you, but I want them to do it always staying on your path, always subscribing to what you have to say. But I let them know that daily. Hey, you're a world changer. You're a world changer. God made you to be a world changer. And so one day, I really think they might believe that. It's not yet. But one day, I think they're going to think that that's true of them. But the prayers that I pray take application. They have to feel capable of changing the world. And it's my job to show them what that looks like and how to do it. I think we're really guilty as parents of saying, you know, go to, go to school, make good grades, become a doctor, take care of yourself, make good money. But we don't talk to them about who they are. And how important is that for them to know that, to be able to accomplish the things that are the most important things to do? Most people will not hesitate to work hard and accomplish things if they know that their hard work and effort is valuable and meaningful. If we think that something we're doing is making a difference, we're going to do it with all of our ability. We're going to do it with everything we have. So we are, to be, we are the ones that are supposed to teach our children how to do that. Train up a child in their strengths, and they will discover the purpose for which they were created. That is something they will not depart from. What if we taught them to be decision makers and learn from the consequences of their sin? Rather than, don't do that, don't do that, no, don't do that. What if we actually gave them permission to fail a little bit? and then learn what that does. Teach them to fail under our own safety net. Um, in this book, Loving Your Kids on Purpose, um, he talks about the happy zone. Please read this book, it is so good. But he talks about the happy zone. So I've so adopted this principle where, um, you know, whatever it might be, if my kids are arguing or fighting or she hit me and she looked at me wrong and blah, 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 you know, they'll go at it and they'll come to me and it's always, mom, mom, you know, ruckus and chaos. And I'll, I'll just say, oh, uh, you're in my happy zone and you're not happy. And I can only have happy people in my happy zone. So you have a choice to make. You can either, one, be unhappy and continue to scream and whine in your room, or two, be happy in my happy zone and let's have a conversation that is very peaceful and loving and we'll talk about what's upsetting you. But she hit me! Uh, uh, you have clearly chosen to be unhappy in my happy zone. Now, would you like to go to your room yourself, or would you like me to carry you? You have another choice to make. And, and I have, like I've literally carried my big five-year-old Emery up to her room at one time, and I've never done it again, because now it's, okay, I'll be happy. And then she'll sit down and have another, uh, just a regular conversation without, well, Jesse gave me a better book, and she gave you. Like, it doesn't, you don't have to have World War III to resolve something. Like, you can come to a conclusion like a normal person in a normal tone of voice. And so I'm teaching my kids that, you know what? You're going to play by my rules, but I can teach you to do that in a really, really loving way. This is how it's going to go. My job as the parent is to offer real consequences, real choices with real consequences. It's not about getting them to comply. It's about teaching them to make choices and that those choices have very real consequences. And that the authority in their life wants to help them to make good choices. Choices that benefit them. The priority in parenting is always connection as opposed to control. Unfortunately for me, the default setting is to feel in control. I, I hate that I fight that, but I do. And so I don't know if you've ever seen the mom in Target that totally loses it on her kids. Like, you better behave or I'm going to knock you into next week. Do you understand me? Yeah. Don't tell CPS that I said that to my kids. But I have said that to my kids. Like, stop acting like fools in the middle of Target, right? And it's because I feel out of control, and I'm, I'm just putting my control on my kids. And that is why they act even crazier when you try to coerce it yourself. 
So why do we lose it? Because we're out of control and we're trying our best to get it back the only way we know how. We think the natural solution, I'm going to motivate them out of fear of punishment. Because I used to carry the wooden spoon with me when I went to Target. And I had it (laughs) in my purse. And so my kids would start acting crazy and I'd just pull it out. I brought it. Yeah. You know, like you're trying to to make them fear your punishment. Like you will comply with me or else. And y'all, that's not the way to go. Don't do this. Like I said, I am not up here because I have it all together. I'm up here because I failed far too many times. So um, what else is going to make them straighten up, right? If we don't fear them into submission, well, control comes from fear. Fear of what will they end up like? What kind of person will they turn out to be? These things play over and over in our mind. Will they ever get married? Will they be able to financially support themselves? And we're thinking when they're three years old, oh my goodness, I have to worry about these issues right this moment. But more importantly, control comes from man-made plans. Plans that we have for our kids. When God very, very clearly in Scripture tells us he knows the plans he has for us, hopes, plans to give us hope and a future. So we bank on that, and we plan like, oh, okay, well, Lord, we know you're good, and we know you have good plans, so my plans for my kids are also good, so I'm just going to run with that. That you have plans to make them successful, that you have plans to make them wonderful and, and famous and popular, or whatever you might want to say, but what if sometimes his plans are to break them a little bit to make them humble? That's not fun to have to watch your children go through that. That's not fun at all. And so we plan on the things for our kids, and somehow we think that when plans change in our lives, their purpose does too. And that's a dangerous place to be for a parent. We can't allow our plans for our children's life to change God's purpose for their life. We're planning the wrong way with this child rearing these days. We plan for success. We plan for wealth. We plan for them to be respectful, Bible-believing babies. And then we get all huffy when we just don't see how it could be possible for this demon-possessed child to ever give me anything good because they're screaming and yelling and throwing fits all over Walmart, right? Can you tell we've had lots of fits out in public? What if we planned a little bit differently? What if we planned for interruptions? What if we plan that, you know what, we might not always have peace of mind when it comes to our kids, and we wrote that into the script? What if we planned for our kids to fail? What if we planned for broken bones to happen, and sometimes worse? I'm not saying wish that on your kids, so please don't take me wrong, but be open to the fact that anything could happen, right? We plan for none of this ever. What if we planned for special needs diagnosis? Diagnosis. Maybe it wouldn't be so devastating if we knew that God was in control and we weren't. And he's very capable of interrupting our plans and making it all work together for the good. So what if we planned for interruptions and expected the unexpected? What if we planned for inconvenience? Y'all, we do not have kids because they're convenient. They are not convenient. Nothing about parenting is convenient at all. We have children to give parts of ourselves away and leave a legacy. And the process of doing that is very inconvenient. It's very time consuming. It's very focus driven. Children come out of the womb demanding your time, your attention, and your prayers, and that never ever changes. So we have to plan for inconvenience. What if we planned for imperfections? I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, so why do we expect our kids to be perfect? Why do we put that on them? Nobody should have to be perfect. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. We all cop an attitude, right? They're not going to grow up to be horrible people because they talked back to you about not wanting milk in their Cheerios. It's just not going to happen. But yet we can let that fluster us so bad. So let's hold them to a Christ-like standard with the realization that they're not Christ. And we shouldn't expect them to be perfect. We get so hard on ourselves and our kids, we stop celebrating our progress. 
Like I said, I'm not the perfect parent by any means, but I see a lot of value in celebrating little baby steps. I see a lot of value in celebrating the progress of my kids. We have a a character trait chart, and so every month we work on a different character trait, and so they'll get in the car, and so like this this month it's been generosity, because I've been slacking, it's been generosity for like several months, but it was generosity, and so they get in the car, and we've explained to them what generosity means, why generosity is important, in our lives and to the Lord and how they can be generous. And so every day they get in school and I'm like, okay, who was generous today? Well, I was generous today. Okay, well, what did you do to be generous? And they'll tell me, you know, like I passed out water bottles to everyone in my class. And I'm like, you know what? You changed the world today. That's awesome. That's awesome. If there were more people like you that would be willing to serve, man, this world would be a better place. And we're celebrating progress. We're celebrating the good things they do. Because if you don't celebrate the good things you do as a person, you're going to stop doing them. (laughs) What's the incentive there, right? And what's the incentive for our kids? So we have to celebrate those. So back to the I know the plans I have for you. Plans don't always work out the way they think they should. We think they should, but that's okay because plans aren't promises. And we have to keep that in mind. Just because the plans we have for our children change, it doesn't mean that the promise does, and it sure doesn't mean that their destiny does either. Plans don't change these things. It just means we're going to have to get there a different way. That's all that means. God is very, very, very intentional about making you trust his promises over your plans. So I'm just going to throw this out there. Sometime he will intentionally change your plans so that you are forced to trust his promises over all the plans that you have for yourself. And it's the surrendering of control that's the hardest part of doing that. Because we have to know as parents, if we're not willing to surrender control of our kids to the one who created them and made them, oh Lord, you're going to have some issues. You're going to have some serious issues. So if I surrender control, Kristen, how do I parent? Well, I like to go back to the verse in everything in my life that there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear and, oil, fear, and, fear and love are like water and oil. They just cannot mix. It's not possible. And so if you'll surrender control as a priority, removing fear as the thing that motivates your kids to comply with you, you're going to position your child to have an opportunity to choose to protect what you value just because they love you. Just because of love. And that's much more effective than making choices out of fear of punishment. So God doesn't want to control you. He's never tried to do that a day in your life, even though you might believe that. He doesn't want to punish you into compliance. He wants you free to choose. Why don't we do the same for our kids? Why don't we stop controlling them and empower them to be powerful people that are free to choose? A child's priority to protect the things you value are often in direct correlation with the connection you have with that child. And this has been the most eye-opening thing for me. If you aren't connected well, you're going to have a problem with your kids. What if you've been so focused on compliance and control that there's no connection enough for them to value what you value? I had, um, this is not a sad story, I promise, but about a year ago, I lost a really, really good friend. And it's, God has shown me so much through losing this friendship. So I promise it's not a sad story. I'm a firm believer that sometimes God will remove people from your life because they're just not healthy. So, um, but I had this friend and um, I used to be like much better than I am today about having get-togethers at my house. And so I tried to have um, lots of consistent get-togethers at my house. And um, I invited her quite often to the get-togethers and she was always really good and she always came you know, it was never a problem. Um, but sometimes I would just, like, move to different— because I like to get to know you people because there's a lot of y'all. And so sometimes I move and I invite different people. And so um, the few times that she didn't get invited, her feelings were very hurt. And I get that. Like, I truly get that. And I didn't know that this was happening because she never came and talked to me about it. And so I went on a girl's trip. Didn't plan the trip, but I went on a girl's trip, and um, she wasn't invited on the trip. And I came back, and she pulled me aside— healthy confrontation. We taught on that a couple weeks ago, right? She pulled me aside and was like, hey, Kristen, um, you're really hurting my feelings. And I was like, 
well, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> please tell me because I, I want to work it out. And so the long and the short of it is, well, you're not inviting me. You know, you're having some get-togethers, and I'm, I'm being left out, and I just didn't, you know, feel like I should be, and, and you didn't invite me on that trip. And to be quite honest, I would have really liked to go on that trip with you. And I was just kind of like, wow. I, you know, it kind of caught me off guard, and I was just like, well, I'm really kind of surprised to hear you say that. I'm really surprised that even upset you. And she was like, well, I don't know why it wouldn't upset me. I've come every other time you've invited me. Why wouldn't I come the times you haven't invited me? And I said, well, I guess to be quite honest, that's just it. I invite you all the time. You've never invited me to anything. I've never had an invitation to your house. You've gotten get-togethers together with people to go out to eat. You've never invited me. And I promise I'm okay with that. I, I, it doesn't bother me, but I guess I didn't know because I'm reaching out and reaching out trying to connect to you, but you're not reciprocating. And so I didn't realize that our friendship was here when I was thinking it was here. And so I apologized all over myself. You know, I am just, I am so sorry I hurt you. I never meant to hurt you. But the fact of the matter is, I was trying really hard to connect to her, and she would receive that connection but she never once reciprocated it. And when you have a friendship and you're the one doing all the inviting and inviting, inviting, and they don't invite you to do anything back, what kind of message does that send? Right? So I went into like a really deep time of reflection on relationships in general and like, well, why am I drawn to certain people? And, and you know, I tried to be real philosophical and deep with it. And it all came down to I invest in the people who invest in me. I will place my heart in the hands of people who will steward it well with care and love. And I'm willing to open up a little bit more to the people who are willing to reciprocate a friendship. And that's so funny because I felt like, well, Sally Sue, I really feel like our friendship's a one-way street. And I'm willing to continue it. I'm, I'm, I'm not cutting you off. But maybe you could shoot me an invite every once in a while. I'm just saying, you know? And she didn't, and we're not friends anymore. And that's okay. I still check on her. I still love her. I'm not angry. It's okay. But you know where this brought me? How often do I do this to my kids? How many times do they try to connect to me on a daily basis? Mom, can you come eat lunch with me? Mom, can you come to my practice? Mom, come watch me ride my bike. Hey, Mom, I wrote a song today. Mom, look at this app I just got on my phone. Watch me play this game. And I'm, I'm a busy woman. I'm like, yeah, not, not right now. Not right now. Okay, okay, not right now. Okay, okay, today I'll come eat lunch with you. And sometimes I receive their invitations, but how often am I actually reciprocating it? Well, no, honey, I can't eat lunch with you today, but what I can do is play Uno with you, with you when I get home. Is that okay? Because as a parent, it's really easy for us to just say, no, we can't, no, we can't, no, we can't, and not really reciprocate every single time they're trying to connect with us. Because I promise if you don't open that parent-child relationship up as a two-way street, they're going to move on to someone else and start trying to connect in other relationships. They're going to invest in the people who invest in them. And that's just kind of how it works. In order for there to be a connection, both parties have to be online or else one's just dialing out, the phone's just ringing, and nobody's answering. And so we got to pick up that phone and be on the other end of the line. Children are going to attempt to connect to attempt to connect with us multiple times a day. Are we being intentional about reciprocation? In order for them to value what we value, we have to value what they value. And if they're valuing riding their bike without training wheels, well, then that needs to be the most important thing for us that day. If we, if y'all have grown children and they value what their children are doing. Well, I know as a, as a mom who has a mom, it's really important for me that my mom values my kids as much as I do. And that opens that communication for me to value the things that she values as well. So we have to make sure that we're, we value stewarding our own freedom with the priority of connection. You'll teach them to do the same thing without ever having to tell them how if you concentrate on who God created and redeemed you to be and speak into their lives who God created and redeemed them to be. And it's really important that we connect with them, but we also connect them to him. I know that was kind of a lot of him, them, this, that. So I hope you got that.
So um, we have to allow them to make choices that protect the connection that we have with them. And that means allowing them to have the freedom to make choices you normally wouldn't make. That's really hard for us control freaks. And they still feel safe that you love, trust, and value who they are, even though they're doing something you normally wouldn't do. So no one ever, it never helps anybody to hear when they make a mistake, right? Nobody likes hearing, oh, you really screwed up, way to go. So that's something that we just need to completely avoid as parents. And when they do make mistakes and they do screw up, for lack of a better term, let's walk them through that and show them how to learn from that. Show them how to not do that. How are we going to do this differently next time as opposed to, well, I told you. I, told, I said that to a friend this week, too, and I felt so bad. I was like, well, I told you. She was, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I was like, so just take that out of your vocabulary. It's not good. Um, as parents, um, we need to be very aware that our children engage in spiritual warfare on a daily basis. And when I say that, all spiritual warfare is, is the devil wants to talk to us about who we are, and God wants to talk to us about who we are. Whose voice are we listening to? And did you know that as parents, we can actually magnify one voice over the other? And we have the power to hand one voice a microphone and for it to be louder than any other voice. So we have to be very, very careful that we are magnifying the right voice so that we are molding and shaping our kids' hearts in a way that is healthy and God-honoring. I do want to be clear here. I don't believe that any of us are perfect parents. Um, just be, but just because we have bad day or bad days in parenting doesn't mean we're bad parents. And so I spend a lot of time talking to ladies who are just like, I am the worst mom ever. No, you're not. Okay, so none of this is to condemn or make anybody feel bad. You're not the worst mom ever. You're not the worst dad ever. Um, it's really crucial, though, that when your children look into your eyes, regardless of the circumstances bearing down on them, that what they see is someone that believes in them. You parents have the power to call those things that be not as though they are in our children's lives. And, and I even say that from a, a perspective of my mom still has that power in my life. I can still call her to this day, although I am grown with my own children, and she has the power to speak life into a situation. And if it comes from Mama Bear, I'm probably going to believe it more. That's just the fact. And that's true for most of us. So how can we help our kids become themselves, whether they're young or old, even every day in the mundane? Um, I really wanted to read you this story. It was so awesome, like I said. Have I told you I recommend this book? Have I said that yet? Okay. Well, this is a really cool story that I'm just like, wow, this is, I don't know how they did this. Oh, I think I gave, whoever I gave this to, I'm going to switch with you. I marked it, didn't I? Okay, yeah. Okay, it's okay. I know where it is. So anyway, this is a story of how a dad um, diffused one of his sons that was really upset. Okay, so I'm just going to read it to you. I remember a time when Levi had heard his brother, Taylor, again. They were still young, around 9 and 11 years old. I heard about the altercation and called my son in from playing in the, uh, playing in the yard. I confronted him with a series of questions in hopes of leading him to a solution. Son, how are you doing? Fine. Awesome. Hey, I was wondering why you punched your brother. I don't know. Okay, well, how about you sit right here until you do know? I'll be right over there, and if you need any help figuring this out, let me know, okay? He's always being mean to me, he blurted out. See, he'd been in that chair before, and he knew that he was in charge of how, he long, how long he stayed there. He wanted to get through this as quickly as possible. Oh, no, he's being mean to you? How is he being mean to you? He doesn't want me to play with him and his friends, and he began to cry. Oh no, you sound like that is hurting your heart. I hate it and I hate him. Ah, you're hating your brother. How is that working out for you? Well, he doesn't care. He loves me. He doesn't love me. And he was really crying at this point. Buddy, this is a big hurt in your heart, isn't it? Yes. What are you going to do? Say sorry? Ah, say sorry. Hmm, do you think Taylor will believe you if you say sorry to him? Uh, I think so. Okay, well, let's try it. I called Taylor in from playing and informed him that his brother had something he'd like to say. Taylor stood with a guarded posture, arms folded in front of Levi. Levi looked at Taylor with a tear-stained face and said, Sorry. I then turned to Taylor and asked, Do you believe him when he says sorry? Taylor said, No, I think he's just trying to not be in trouble anymore. 
Ah, I said, Tay, thanks for coming in. See you later. And he ran off to play. I then turned to Levi and said, dang, that didn't seem to work. What are you going to do now? I don't know. He was almost distraught. What can I do if he doesn't believe me when I say I'm sorry? Great question, son. Why doesn't Taylor believe you when you say you're sorry? I don't know. Do you need some time to think it over? No, but I don't know what to do. Do you mind if I ask you some more questions? No? Okay. You told me that Taylor had done some things that hurt your heart, like he wasn't letting you join in with him, when his with him and his friends. Is that right? Yes. Did you ever forgive your brother for hurting you? No. Do you think that this may be why you keep hurting him? Because even though this happened a while ago, it feels like he's still hurting you? Yeah. What are you going to do, son? Forgive Taylor. Ah, how do you think that will work out for you? Better. Cool. Is that something you want to do by yourself, or do you want my help? Your help? Okay. Well, how do you think Jesus is feeling knowing that you're hurting your brother, sad or glad? Sad. Do you want to clean this mess up with Jesus too? Yeah. Okay. Well, repeat after me. And I led him through a prayer of repentance and forgiveness, and I asked him, how do you feel? Way better. What are you going to do now? I think I want to ask Taylor again to forgive me, and I think he'll believe me this time. I am really sorry now. Awesome. Go get him. How amazing is that? To me, all that is is a freedom ministry session <laughs> with a kid, <laughs> asking them questions and getting them to own their emotions pulling out what's really bothering them at the root. Because we know that behavior is simply a manifestation of something in your heart that really hurts. Something in your heart that isn't right. This is different from punishment, where we banish them to solitude and they're not in control. Go sit in time out until I tell you you can come back. Right? Very different from that. They're, le they're learning that decisions they make on the outside can create, create hurt on the inside. That's a very important principle for our kids to know. This could be a 30-second punishment or a three-hour punishment. They get to choose. They're in control. And what I loved about him is he kept asking him questions. He defined the heart issue, and he's like, is that the problem we're solving? Yes. Oh, okay. Are you the one to solve it? Yes. That's empowering. That's so empowering for our kids. And then when we send our kids off when they're old and grown, who has some mad problem-solving skills? These kids, they know how to navigate through life because they have the ability to solve their own problems. If we parent like this, we are stewards of our children's freedom. And they're going to learn that mom and dad, or maybe just mom or dad if you're a single parent, is always there to help guide them. But mom and dad does not have the answers. They simply lead them to the one who does to get the, to the root of their problem. So if they learn that they can come to us to help guide and direct them, they'll learn to go to God in the same manner too. I, I'm, I feel very strongly that when Ephesians 6, 2 says, honor thy mother and father, it is under the assumption that we as parents are honoring our kids and treating them like they are valuable, like they are precious, and not little minions that need to take orders from us. It works both ways. So we can require them to be responsible for their own decisions without yelling, screaming, and a whole bunch of drama, teaching them that there are consequences to their actions, not punishment for poor decisions. I'm a firm believer that the punishment should fit the crime. I had a, a friend call me the other day. She was really upset because um, her daughter wasn't getting up from school. She was like, I don't know what to do because our mornings are crazy. She's like a strong Latino woman. She throws sandals at her kid and stuff like that. So it was like crazy mornings. And I was just like, okay, okay, well, um, what are you do What time's your daughter going to bed? And so anyway, her daughter was going to bed really late because she was involved in extracurricular activity. And um, I was like, well, don't you think the, fun the punishment needs to fit the crime? Like, you're throwing sandals at her, but really you should be putting her to bed earlier? <laughs> I don't know, just an idea. And so I told her, why don't you try this? <laughs> Tomorrow morning, you know, tell her, hey, tonight, because you didn't get up, you're going to have to go to bed an hour earlier. And she was like, well, I can't because her extracurricular activities. You know, she's at practice till 9, 930. And I said, oh, does she like practice? Yes, she loves it. Okay. Well, how about this? Tomorrow morning, be nice and calm. No sandal throwing. No name calling. Just tell her, hey, Sally Sue, if you don't get up, that's going to show me that you're really tired and you need to sleep in tonight and you'll have to miss practice. And you know what? Then she has a choice to make. And lo and behold, and I, and I told her, 
plan for her not to get up. She's probably not going to get up. She's probably not going to believe you the first time. And she was like, okay. So she said, it was the best morning. I knew she wasn't going to obey me. I knew she wasn't going to get up. So I didn't throw a sandal. And I didn't like yell and scream at her. I just told her, you know what? You're going to have to miss practice tonight. And then I made her miss practice. And she never did it again. Right? That's teaching your kids. There's consequences for your choices. There's, there's not punishment for poor decisions. So punishment reacts out of fear, and fear undermines the priority of connection. It robs us of our freedom. Um, so whenever we feel that rising up in us, like I'm, I'm a strong southern Irish blooded woman, and so it's, I have tendencies to just get mad when my kids don't do what I tell them to do. Whenever I feel feel that rising up, I have to remind myself that the priority is a connection with me and that child. And if I'm going to go to yelling and ranting and raving, I sever that. And I no longer have a connection. And why should they listen to the words that I'm saying coming out of my mouth when there is no connection there whatsoever? So I have to really remind myself to really, really, really just love the contents of what's inside their heart and protect that as opposed to trying to get them to just do what I say. If I want to parent the way God parents, when I feel out of control, my priority has to be connection and to steward the contents of what's in their heart. Um, just as a side note, I am a believer in the rod of correction. I do believe in spankings. I think they're good. Um, in, in our house, we have things that are automatic spankings, and you just know, you talk to me like that, you're going to get a wooden spoon. I'm sorry you made that choice. Please bring me the wooden spoon. But then there's times when I offer them a chance to do it over again. And I'll say, would you like a redo? Would you like to reword that? Or would you like a wooden spoon? You choose. And then they get to choose to redo, reword, or get the wooden spoon. And so some things, it, it, every, everybody decides their own. You'll tolerate, and you'll give second chances. Some things just, uh-uh. There will be no talking back to me and yelling at me. Not in this house. That's not okay. And, and, and can I just say, I know we're running out of time, but this is so important to me. Don't, don't ever punish out of anger. That really isn't very healthy. So when you're, when you're really mad, just self-control, please. <laughs> self-control. You know, it's much more effective to say, I'm really sorry you made that choice. I need you to go get the wooden spoon. Then go get the wooden spoon right now bad boy. You know, like I'm saying, it's just not good to punish in anger. Like, keep your calm and just tell them, you know, I'm really sorry you made that choice. Now you have to get the wooden spoon. So they know you're, you're on their side. You don't want to do that, but that's what they earned. Um, God will allow us to face the consequences of our choices, and we have to let our children to do the same, whether that's good or bad. We have, to, we have to allow them to face their own consequences and foster the connection. And when we do that and we have the connection, we have those ministry moments with our kids. You know, if you're screaming your head off at them, where's the ministry moment in that? But if you can keep your head, you're cool, send them, you know, get the wooden spoon and then sit them down and make eye contact and say, hey, what can we do better next time? Let's talk about why you had to get the wooden spoon and how we can not do that again then you're probably going to see better results than just whacking their booties and sending them to their room. Doesn't really teach them much. And I hope I'm not coming across judgmental. I don't mean that by any means. I'm just telling you what I've learned, okay? It just works. It just works. In John 8, 14, Jesus is teaching in the temple, and he's being questioned about who he was. And I love how he answers. Even if I testify, testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. And I love what he says here because he says, yeah, I don't really care what you think about me because I know who I am. And he knew who he was because of the connection he had with his heavenly father. And I'd be willing to bet that he had a pretty good one with his earthly mom and dad too. And I'd be willing to bet earthly mom and dad really, really, really fostered his identity to a point to where he truly couldn't doubt who he was. Like I said, our little JC is really good athlete. She's really phenomenal at sports. And so Chris and I always tell her, you're the best one on the team. You score all the goals. And, and you know what? She started to believe that, but she started to go to school and tell everybody, I'm the best one on the team. I score all the goals. And that wasn't going over real well with some of her teammates. And so she came back home, and I was just like, yeah, you can't really say that, but it is true. You know, and so like I had a little dilemma. But I was like, you know what, JC? This is what you're going to tell them. My dad said I'm the best one on the team. My mom said I score all the goals. 
And when she can start to believe that we believe in her in that way, it takes the pressure off of her to be the best one on the team because she knows we already believe that's true about her. And nobody can argue with what her mom and dad say. Come talk to me about it, kid. I'll tell you what I think, right? So we have to really, really speak life into our kids in a way that it sets up a really strong belief system about who they are and who God is in their life. We are their heart monitor. We train them up. We are responsible for what goes in and comes out of our children's life. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So parenting effectively is learning to foster the content of what's inside your children's heart more than just getting them to obey. If what comes out of their life flows from the contents of what's in their heart, what kingdom is your children, are your children agreeing with? What kingdom are you reinforcing in their life? What voice are you magnifying? Because when mama and daddy say it, it's true. It's true. And sometimes it takes some time to establish that, but it's really, really true. Um, I, I, I listened to a, a man teach on this once, and I was just like, brilliant! So I've been trying it. But basically his daughter came home from school one day, and she was failing. She was getting all Fs on her, on her report card, and he set her down. And he said, you know what, Jillian? I need you to answer me a question. Are you smart or are you dumb? Well, I'm smart. You know what? I believe that's true about you. In fact, I believe you're one of the smartest kids I know. So what are we going to do to get you on a plan to make your behavior line up with the fact that you're smart, with who you truly are? And they sat down, and together they devised a plan to pull away from the cell phone, pull away from extracurricular activities. And she was a part of that decision-making process because she believed she could do it. But what didn't happen was she didn't come home and get shamed for failing and get her phone ripped out of her hand and made it even worse. It was powerful and effective because he's reinforcing you're smart, you're capable, let's work together to get your behavior to line up with who you are. How powerful is that? And we have the ability to do that with our kids. We have the ability to make sure that they are becoming the person God created and redeemed them to be. And isn't that how God parents us? He so does. So guilt, shame, and condemnation free, but with the utmost respect for his authority, we can step into the parent God called us and created us to be. So I'm going to go into a, a, a time of ministry, but really and truly, I just have three questions that I want you to ask God. So if you will bow your heads. I know for me, I'm a visual learner, so it really helps me to picture God I will have him take me to a safe place, just me and him, to where I can just sit and talk to him. And I kind of want you to get alone, just, just you and God, however you hear God. And, and I'm going to lead you in asking him three questions tonight. And the first question is, Lord, what is your favorite thing about me? Sometimes you'll just get a thought in your mind, a picture in your head, a scripture in your heart. God talks in so many ways. Lord, what is your favorite thing about me? How can I use this to be a better parent? And if you aren't a parent, how can I use this to be a more effective influencer?
And Lord, what is one thing you want to tell me tonight that I never heard or didn't hear enough from my earthly parents? So God, you have the ability to fill in the gaps in every area of our life. In the times that we don't feel we measure up, but we do, you are there cheering us on. And Lord, in the times when we didn't receive enough love, you are overwhelming and abounding in love. And you have the ability to just make our heart mold to what yours is. And so, God, I pray tonight, Lord, that you would speak to us even as we go home about parenting, Lord Jesus. And and even for for those who aren't parents, man, we all have influence. We all have parental authority in somebody's life. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless that. I pray that we would be a people who always ask your opinion and advice before we move forward in giving any to our kids of our own. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would value what you value. And as we value what you value, our kids would value what we value. Lord, I pray, Father, for freedom to be unleashed in Houston. I pray for a a congregation full of people who know who they are. And Lord, that is different for all of us. Our identity is in you alone. And the fact that you create each person with a different skill set and different talents and different ways of utilizing that is so powerful. In fact, Lord, it's so beautiful. And just the way you work is amazing. So Lord, would you open our eyes to see you in every area of our life? Would you open our eyes to see you in the places we never even think to look for you? And Lord, would you empower us to be really good moms and dads? And would you empower us to see the good in our own moms and dads? The places and the times where they possibly failed us, you make the difference up. And God, we thank you for that. And so Lord, I pray that you would set joy in every heart in this room. I pray, Father, that you would call out those things that are not in us. That as our dad, you have our permission tonight, Father, to call out things like beauty, and security, things that are powerful, Father, that you have set in every heart. Call it out in every person tonight, Father, so when we walk out of here, we are more empowered by the Holy Spirit than when we came in. You are a good God, and your love is unending, and for that we are eternally grateful. In your precious and holy name I pray, amen. Hey, so um, just in case you didn't know, there's this really good book called Loving Your Kids on Purpose. (laughs) And if you have young kids, you should really read it. So anyway, uh, guys, thanks for coming. Thanks for being here next week. um, I do believe Pastor is going to be continuing his study in here. And for those of you who would like to join us in Freedom, Pastor Shara is actually speaking on Freedom from Toxic Thinking. It's a really, really good class because she's been talking to me about it and I'm really excited to hear about that class and that's going to be in multi-purpose room A. So you guys be blessed and have a great week.